Coming to you direct from the nerve center of the galaxy's greatest comic. This is the 2000 AD Thrill Cars. Thank athletes and welcome to the latest episode of the 2000 AD Thrillcast. I am your host as always, Mulchart. I hope that you are all staying safe and well. On this episode, we talk to uh, an artist called Dermot Power. Now, those of you who know your 90s comics, particularly 2000 AD, will know who Dermot is. Um, I first encountered his uh, artwork with the very first issue that I got of, uh, regularly of 2000 AD, in which uh, there was a story called The Apartment. Uh, which was a, a one part by John Wagner. It was a post necropolis story, and uh, Dermot painted that episode, and I've loved his work ever since. He worked on um, Teddy Choppermitz and Muzak Killer with Garth Ennis. He worked on Book of the Dead with Mark Miller, The Big Sleep with uh, Peter Hogan. Um, he then worked on Slain with Pat Mills, uh, while also doing work for uh, Marvel UK on Digitech in Overkill. Um, he then moved away from comics and went on to work in film and it was fascinating to be able to talk to him about uh, that transition, um, what it meant for him as an artist, how he's changed um, and uh, yeah it was absolutely delightful uh, to be able to chat our way to him. Um, as always, if you have any feedback on the 2080 Thrillcast, you let us know at thrillcast at 2080.com. We've been getting some really good suggestions. We are working on them to try and uh, see if we can make them work, but uh, bear with us on that. We've got more deep dives coming up in the future. Um, but in the meantime, let's uh, have a chat with Dermot Power. Uh, I hope you enjoy this, Earthlets. See you on the other side. <laughs> Thank you for for wanted to chat because I'm 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 going to be honest. I don't normally do this on 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 the podcast, but um, uh, I'm a huge fan of your dread work. <laughs> Good, thank you. Um, because uh, you started on 2000 AD at just the time that I started reading the regular prog. Right. Okay. But I think um, your first dread story, which was the apartment, was yep. um, the first prog that I regularly picked up from. For my news agents. Yeah, you were probably picking it up in the news agent when I was sitting in Morrison Crescent tube station, <laughs> wanting to kill myself. Because when I when that came out, I was I was so depressed. I couldn't really. Why? Yeah. Well, I think because I was first of all, I looked at the comic book for the the kind of co color level, and then I kind of tuned that. This makes me sound like I was being really professional, but I just thought, well, this sort of tone is about the right level of color, and of course, I didn't realize that they go down a couple of grades and, you know, they, they print, especially on the paper they were using back then, it's going to look a lot more desaturated and muddy. Mm. And uh, that's the first problem. And the second problem is, it was sort of the first thing I drew, and I think it was the first one, or maybe it was the Clegg's one, I can't remember. And I just wasn't very good at drawing. So I, I was getting, it, it, I mean, it's very good because it makes you, it, when you see your stuff actually published, that's and you feel the audience looking at it you're not sitting in your bedroom just you know thinking this is really really cool and i think when i had a, that objective look and it was probably a couple of months since i handed it in i was just like oh my god that's absolutely awful but then you then you learn pretty fast because you learn in public so yeah that, that, that was a problem that an awful lot of uh artists seem to have because we had carl critchlow on on the the podcast uh, a few weeks ago and uh, he was the same you know you, you look at his work on nemesis around about the same time we did the nemesis and deadlock story and yeah. you know it's just these murky panels where the printing yeah. completely destroyed all the detail i mean it, it i mean it must have been infuriating um it hid a lot of sins as well though so you know <laughs> <laughs> so i didn't mind I, and you know you could kind of, it was a valuable lesson because you, I, through my whole career in film as well, I work in broad strokes. You know, I know we do these very, for 2008 and Slane and stuff, I did very finished painted stuff, but you try to work in a broad stroke that would survive the printing and survive all the different uh, color variation that happens in, in when it's printed on different types of paper stock and all the rest of it. And you kind of have to, 
accept that you just get used to it kind of thing but it can be yeah it can be very frustrating especially when i was first doing digital work because i didn't know about color profiles and uh i didn't know to to send in the artwork with all this extra stuff kind of metadata that you need to give the printers i didn't know anything and the first stuff that was printed was just way too dark and it was awful and it was um but again you learn you, you kind of learn all that stuff um but uh yeah well let, let's let's kind of uh, reach further back okay loop round back to this the, this moment yeah. when uh, your work and my uh, youth intersected um yeah. so uh you you you're from ireland yes um, tell us, uh, I'm always interested in, in um, and anybody who's listened to the podcast will, will know that I do tend to uh, dig down into this, um, about the, the, the uh, environment in which you grew up and, and the role that art and comics played in that. I mean, were you from an artistic? Yeah, my dad was a, is, a, is an artist. Hmm. Um, and he always was a watercolour landscape painter. But we always had books about drawing in the house. And, we, and my particularly my brothers, my two older brothers, we, they, we drew all the time and had a kind of very competitive uh, sense, you know, there was a lot of competitiveness between me and my two older brothers. And both of them, one became an architect and the other's a musician. And David, my oldest brother, is an architect, he used to draw very cleanly and precisely. And Jared, who became the musician, he used to draw, remember he's obsessed with uh, jaws and hook jaw in action comic. And he would draw the shark and it would have all the moldings and shadow and it was really kind of cool. So both of those kind of probably influenced me as well. But um, there was absolute, and of course I bought 2000 AD when it came out. I bought Action Comic when it came out. I, my interest in comics was, um, you know, Warlord and Battle to some extent, except they were the other side. And then into Action Comics and then um, 2000 AD. And um, I absolutely loved it, but I had no clue about drawing comics or anything. I had no intention of it, none at all. So what, what, was, what was the impact on, on you? Because I, I think in, in previous interviews, you, you've, you've talked about having a fairly sheltered life, uh, you know, in terms of the kind of media that you were uh, absorbing. Um, what was the impact of something like action, which, you know, was... was oh, no, it's not, it's not that it's a sheltered life. It's yeah. that I'm in a small town in Ireland and you've got... You know, and we didn't have the BBC and ITV, but we had our three, two channels, and you had your three channels. This is before Channel 4 even. So it's like, like this is, we all had sheltered lives. There's no way of getting anything. When I went to see Star Wars, um, I bought the vinyl album soundtrack because I was obsessed with Star Wars, and I was like, I need to have a bit of this. You couldn't have any of it unless you bought, like, vinyl soundtracks there was nothing so when 2000 AD came out me and my friends at the time absolutely loved it but we loved action first mm. but it's not that we we got everything it would probably be the equivalent of a small town in England my small town in Ireland it wasn't um it wasn't really sheltered it was just we were all cut off back then you know I mean you could say sheltered because it was very Catholic Ireland background, but even then it wasn't. It was just the yeah. same, I, I, I think. Yeah. It, I suppose, because uh, how old were you when 2008 came out? Um, what was the year again? Uh, so it was nine. 77, so it was nine. Right. Ten. I mean, that makes you basically the, the perfect 2008 reader, nine years old in 1970. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Spot on. Yeah, absolutely. And Star Wars as well. We're, we're the sort of. Yeah, that was the generation. I, I, I mean, I've said this before. I remember seeing a clip of Star Wars and just thinking, this thing is going to go past me by somehow. Mm. And I can't realize that that's going to be terrible. Because I, I was like, what the hell is this? But at least 2000 a day, it was in the comic shop every week. Mm. Every week. It was fantastic. It was, yeah, it was really good. But again, I know you're really dumb when you're a kid because it doesn't occur to you. I've heard a lot of artists, comic artists say this. It doesn't occur to you that you can draw this. I mean, you do draw it but that you would do it as a, as a profession. So, yeah. you know. So it, it takes you how, how, how you transition from a kid, not, not thinking that you could become a comic book artist to the point where actually. Yeah, I had no intention of doing it. And mm. I stopped reading comics because none of my friends when I was a teenager read comics. 
Yeah. And none of, I was really into science fiction and all that kind of stuff, but in films more than comics. And about the age of 15, I stopped, stopped reading comics entirely. And then I came over to London looking for work and I bailed college and uh, was trying to make it as an illustrator. And two things happened at the same time. I, I kept getting criticized for my work looking too comic booky, mm. right? And I, then I was walking down the street and I saw Bisley's Slough Fed cover. <laughs> You're just a face. Yeah. I was like, what the, what, what's this? And then when I saw what he was doing and what was being done, I was like, when did comics become this? <laughs> and, and you have to remember that there was a gap when I would not, I would have just loved Judge Dredd in 2000 AD. And I remember I, there were certain artists I really liked, but I wouldn't have known who they were. I wouldn't have been trying to figure out how they did it or anything. And then of course I used to also get the American, some superhero American comics, but I wasn't as interested because it just wasn't as, just wasn't as interesting to me, even as a kid. Um, so when I saw that artwork and this sort of, you know, I, and then so, so Sinkovich's Electra Assassin or, you know, um, and then of course Bolland. I mean, Bolland was there when I was a kid, mm. but I didn't separate him out. But then when I started, I thought oh, I should have a look again. And then you see that and you go, oh my God, that, that is the, such amazing work. You can't believe it. And then the instinct is not, um, you, just, you just feel, oh, I want to do something like this. I want to do this. And then coincidentally, people had been um, criticizing me work, my work for looking too comic booky. And then I got, I thought, well, okay, I'll, I'll look into doing that. And I've got in touch with David Lloyd and the Cartoon Center. And I went to his class to David's class every week for about a year. And that was really good because he dialed down all the enthusiasm a little bit. You know, what, I mean? uh, he, he, what I'm saying is he would make you focus on storytelling and before style. And then um, that was very useful. I mean, that, that sort of gave me a good grounding. So I'm very, very grateful to David for that. Um, but it was, if I'm honest, it's, it's, it, I remember seeing a Fabry thing. I can't remember exactly what it was. I, I, I think it was Glenn had done some vampire thing. And again, it was just like, I cannot believe what I'm seeing. It's so beautiful. It's so, it was, I think maybe I'd come out of art college um, very disappointed because I thought, you know, I, I grew up as a kid in drawing competitions with my brothers mm. and my dad handing us books about drawing and talking to me about drawing and proportions of the human body and color theory and all that kind of stuff. He never, never really got deep into it. It wasn't like, but you know, he, we talked about this stuff. So I thought I'd go to our college and I will learn another level again of detail. I don't mean better or worse. I just mean another level of detail about drawing. And there, it wasn't, it was more, more, it's like they're teaching the theater. It was mm -hmm. closer to theater. Um, so I came out thinking I could draw. And then when I tried to do comics, I was like, oh, I can't really draw. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's when you're trying to tell a story, it's, 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 I mean, it's amazing. And the thing about people like Bisley and Fabri and people like that, I kind of thought, well, as I get more experienced, I'll be, I'll, their secrets will emerge. And I've, but they just, now when I look at their stuff, it, it's, it gets better. The more experience I get, the better their work is. It's, it's like, oh my God, it's even better than I thought it was. But yeah, anyway, that was the thing. It was pure enthusiasm and, and just like, wow, I'm amazed by that. I really want to be part of this. And not in the way any other traditional American comics never gave me that feeling. I mean, I, you know, John Buscema and Neil Adams, I thought they're great artists and I admire it, but but it, it didn't give me that, like, when I first saw Electra Assassin, I'm like, Jesus, that's just amazing. It's so beautiful, you know. So anyway, that's, that was my um, uh, initial sort of, um, yeah, what would you say, introduction to this new wave of comics at that time. That, uh, that these guys I, I, again, I guess uh, 
that's a great bit of timing. You know, it, it, you, you were nine years old when um, 2000 AD comes out. And then just as you're progressing from, did you say you, you failed? Did I miss you? Did you say no, you I failed. failed? You bailed, right, right. No, I did two years and then I took a year off and never went back. That, that's so cool. I, I'm going to say this to get it because um, as we've been doing the, lock the lockdown tapes, doing, you know, doubling the, the, yeah. the number of episodes we've done and talking to artists and the sheer number <laughs> who've either left art college early or been thrown out yeah. or just gone, this isn't for me, is incredible. And then gone on to, to, to do comics. And it, it, it sounds like exactly the same thing that you kind of expect to learn to do something at art college, to learn a skill. Yeah. But that's not, that never seems to be. No, I, and I don't want to be a, a sort of knocker because some of my best friends I made in art college and mm. they're still great friends. And also it's good to teach you that art isn't about a pencil and, and recording reality. Yeah. But I wanted to learn that. I mean, not record reality. I just, you know, and you know, there's all sorts of, Maybe, you see, I don't even like hearing myself say it, but there could be some snobbery about certain types of illustration or whatever, but I, I don't care about any of that conversation. I just wasn't getting what I needed to learn in our college. Other people, you know, the other part of it is, if you're smart, you'll find the teachers that will teach you that or help you. Um, but, they're, but most of the time, it's about trying to break up a, a teenager's idea of what art is. And that's a valuable thing to do as long as you can come back around again and learn the bloody techniques, you know. Um, so maybe that's what they did in the third year. You just, you just, I just uh, left. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I never went back. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but I guess, it, um, come back to the point I was making that, um, with, uh, but at the time you'd done that, there, there was this change happening at 2000 AD. It was transitioning from, a, a, traditional illustration as it were into things like you know Bisley and Glen Fabry and everything so yeah. it, it just it is remarkable how you were exactly the right age for both of those things to yeah happen. but you know what I wish I'd stuck with it through the 80s right I missed out I had a lot of catching up then to do I, I, and I, I felt like a bit of an imposter in some ways because mm -hmm. I, I started off and very quickly fortunately I started working as an artist for 2018 and um, I kind of, you know, I'd go to conventions and I wouldn't know half the stuff people were on about because there was a gap. I had to, I've caught up pretty quickly. I bought all, I went to a lot of conventions, got loads of books and, you know, all that kind of thing. But in some way that was kind of interesting because I was informed by things outside, you know, like pre-Raphaelite painting and stuff like that. Um, uh, you know, Tadima and John Waterhouse and people like that, which I've, tried to plug in as well, you know, so, th so there was some other, ins there was some other inspiration that didn't just come up from comics, mm -hmm. which might have been useful, I don't know. I just would have had more fun in the 80s if I was <laughs> reading the darn things instead of giving up in it. Um, I mean, a good example is because, I, I, like some of my really close friends from home, they're just not interested in this stuff, mm. okay? So we were all mad into music. That was, I was obsessed with, goth music Bauhaus basically enjoyed vision and I still listen to that stuff um when I was a teenager that's that was my obsession and you know going around with you know dressed like a goth and um but um so but I always had this real interest in like Blade Runner and uh sci-fi you know aliens or whatever and I remember I did an interview for 2000 AD um one of those little droid interviews you know those single panels yeah. and they asked what's your favorite films and i said um star wars blade runner and alien are my top three favorite films and if i had been with my mates from home i wouldn't dare have said that i'd have gone well taxi driver you know i would have uh, apocalypse now and the godfather of course yeah, yeah. um so because that's what my friends were into and I remember the first time I met um, Chris Halls, Chris Cunningham, mm. at some thing or, or whatever, some 2008 thing. And I think Rob was there, Rob Bliss. And Chris like, oh yeah, I saw that your favorite films. And I was a bit embarrassed. I was like, uh, well, you know, it's a sci-fi come. And then he and his mate was, I was like, oh, there's all these people who that is their favorite films. <laughs> and I just wasn't around people like that. Do you mm. know what I mean? I, I, I still don't. I've, my 
friends I've made from the industry are into that, but yeah. my friends I grew up with have zero interest in that. Mm. So I was kind of a little bit like, oh, wow, there's all of this. There's all these people. Fantastic. And then, you know, then you have a whole other side of your life that you can be interested in. So, yeah, no, it's cool. Uh, it's, it's interesting, the, the, the effect of friendship groups when you are younger on, on what your interests are, because you want to share things, you know? When, when yeah, you're just friends. embarrassed. Yeah. You, you're just, if to be caught, when you're 16, to be caught into the wrong thing is, is you know, embarrassing. I, I, I was into Doctor Who when I was, uh, Doctor well, Who. See, that is embarrassing. 16, so, you know, <laughs> plenty to be embarrassed about there. <clears throat> anyway. Um, I'm only joking. That's one of those things that skipped us completely. That's Sunday night doctor who thing we didn't have the bbc so no yeah yeah we had logan's run before you did that though oh really i don't think people don't know about logan's run over here you know logan's run yeah, yeah, the TV yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but i've said that to people they're going mm. it was a big part of our childhood so right, yeah. right. yeah okay fair enough um, but, so um you're at this point where you know you were looking for work. People were saying your stuff's too too cartoony, but it was um, it was actually through uh, games, video games, that you ended up coming to 2000 yes. AD. Yes, yes, that bloody cover that was on every back cover of every episode of everything to do with 2000 AD for about a year. I was like, oh god, that Judge Dredd video game cover. Yeah, no, I did. Um, no, I shouldn't complain because it was first professional it was the first thing, well actually i did some kids book stuff and some greeting cards there's there's some santa claus greeting cards out there that i did someplace um so um but um yeah no what happened was the i did that game cover i had done so i had been doing some spec work for 2000 AD, mm. right just to see could i get work in there yeah. and it wasn't very good but whatever. And then um, I had also been going to David Lloyd's Cartoon Centre and one of the guys there, I can't remember who it was, had got a game cover to do. And I was like, well, what? I didn't even know this was a thing. So I remember I, I contacted a few people and I got an interview with Virgin Games and they looked at my portfolio and they were like, okay, this is great. We'd like you to do the cover for the Judge Dredd game. And I was like, Oh, uh, I don't. I think you should get Brian Bolland to do it. That's the, the the my actual answer to them was immediately you should get Brian Bolland to do it. And the guy who interviewed me interviewed me. Thankfully, it was like you've done a very good interview. You know, don't blow it. We want you to do it. And I was like, oh Jesus. Okay, so I did that, and then that sort of got me in with Richard Burton at the time and got me a conversation going and then they gave me a cover to do and then that's yeah but yeah that's what I think that's what sort of um got me going really was that cover so I'm very grateful but I did see it was on the back of every it's just like oh my god that's gonna drive people crazy but yeah that was good. I mean look looking at that the uh, the Bolland influence is yes. absolutely crystal clear in that really isn't it yeah 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 Yes, absolutely. I mean, that's my whole career is until the last few pages. Well, we'll probably get there, but the last 10 pages of, of the last Slain book is just a sum of everybody I'm influenced by, in my opinion. It's just, like, that was Barland with a bit of, um, um, uh, oh God, his name is, um, Jesus, who did Kraken? Um, you know, the crack and dread, beautiful, coloured, brightly coloured, John Higgins. He was a big influence in the colour I was using. In fact, the first, I think the very first thing was ever published for 2002 was a back cover of a, of a summer special mm. on these really bright, gaudy colours because I made the mistake of thinking when I saw John Higgins' colour work, that he uses all of these bright colours, yeah, but he really knows how to use them, so they don't come across as looking at a box of Quality Street. Tell me a little bit more about um, the, the the cartoon centre stuff with David Lloyd, because I, 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 I haven't encountered many people who who did that. So tell us a little bit about um, was it was it literally just like a course you went on? It was just David. You go in every week, and David was there, and he would teach. 
right? And, and they had um, some sample script pages that would be, you know, there was one about a, a woman coming home and she finds a crocodile in her bath. And there's another one with a bicycle. It was, it was full of things that were difficult to draw and awkward and boring, like, cause you'd have a bath and a bedroom. It was all, it was almost sort of trying to teach you to draw comics the boring way, you know, as in just hear some, face the fact that not everything is going to be dread pointing a gun at somebody and blowing their head off. It's going to be some boring stuff as well. Mm. And it was about storytelling and, and that kind of thing. And I think I thought, you know, I was so amazed by Boland at the time and um, uh, Jesus, what's his name? Colin Wilson. Mm. I remember him doing dread stuff and I, I mean, it's just unbelievable. It was so beautiful and sharp and clean. But you know what? I can't do it. I just don't have the, I, my hand is too shaky. I've, I've got a very unprofessional grip of a pen. And I've, with the Wacom pens, I've, most people wear the nibs down. I've broken Wacom pens because I hold them so hard, so tightly. It's really unprofessional. And um, that, that beautiful line that Bolland gets, or any of the artists who, come, who have been, I mean, Bolland has taken it to a, another realm but who've been influenced by the neil adams or the same you know the 1970s that yeah. style i just can't do it I'm, I'm i can i need to be pushing down on on the whatever i, I put a lot of weight down I, I find it very difficult to control it but i kind of tried and then i would at the first few things i did with david i was trying to ape that kind of style and um it was a bit torturous, but he was much more about the storytelling anyway. He didn't care about that. And um, I think I went there for about a year on and off, just went off up there every Tuesday night kind of thing with your stuff and whatever. And I remember then I started getting professional work. I did that dread cover and I still went back to David's class because I really wanted to learn about comics. That's where I was really, really interested in. Mm. And um, yeah, I mean, the thing is, I think I, you know, graduated early from that, if you like. You know, I did, like once I started doing professional work, I was just too busy trying to finish the pages. I was like, come on. Plus, to be honest, I, I knew if I showed them to David, he would find problems with them and I'd have to change them. And I didn't have time. I mean, I was like, no, I'm just going to have to learn it. <laughs> you know what I mean? It would be like, ah, just got to do it. I mean, that's the thing about comic books. It's very much, it's, you know, it's, a, it's an art form that taps into your creative urges of, the, of a, you know, like, I just want to do it. Leave me alone. I just want to do this. You know, just leave me alone. It's like, you, David was fantastic for giving me some formal training, but I needed to, you know, escape and make mistakes, which I've made lots of and figure it out uh, that way. But no, he gave me some really good grounding. But I don't know who else, I don't know if anybody else, I, I don't know. It, it's, not, it's not something that's, that's I mean, my, my memory's on the, on the fritz at the best of times, but it's not really something that's ever cropped up before. That, that's, that's really interesting. Um, yeah. You went through that. But it, in, in terms, so while you were doing that, it was the, when you were picking up like the bits that were like the, the Christmas cards and... No, that was before that. That's oh, when right. I first came over here. Yeah, and then I did some kids' books. And you slave away and get 90 quid at the end of three weeks for just drawing all these black and white drawings. And oh, it was just terrible. Again, I was trying to do that black and white ballin kind of style, but I just, I don't know. I don't know what I was doing. You know, I mean, you're, you know, I'm 19, I was 20. So, so, you know, what age is it? Yeah. Um, so, although there's two things on the in magazine interview that, is it Steve did the interview? With yeah. Me. yeah he called me a late bloomer and i was like I, th I thought i started pretty early actually but then i guess steve dylan was like 16 wasn't he yeah yeah pretty yeah. Much. yeah and um the other thing he that was very unfortunate is he i said that um the traditional kind of american comic style I'm just not that interested in it. He changed, somebody took a word out and said, I'm just interested in it, which gave the exact opposite of what I was trying to say. And I was like, oh, okay. So now <laughs> for anybody who read that, I meant I was just not interested in it. <laughs> <laughs>
I was interested in Balin, like Man and Bisley and Frizzetta. Anyway. So the, the once you had, um, you were doing stuff on, on Spectre Try and Get into 2000 AD, and then you did the, the, the Virgin Games covers. How did yeah. that translate into actual work for 2000 AD? Oh, they gave me the back cover to do. Mm. And then I think Andy Lanning and John Tomlinson had written um, Juvenile Kung Fu, Mutated Kung Fu Clegs. Do you yeah. remember that one? Yeah, yeah, I'd love yeah. to redraw that, actually, because it's a great, funny little story. And I just, you know, I found the drawings for that recently because mm. I've put all my original art up on my website in the last couple of weeks. Because the virus has meant we've I've finally had some downtime to do some things like that, and um, the drawings are really good. I was really surprised. I was, I mean, for for compared to what I remember, <laughs> like by this, I think what happened was I would draw little thumbnails, then I would do more details, and then I more more detail. By the time I was painting, I was so bored. I, I just oh, it was just I killed them. They were dead. Whereas the drawings are actually pretty fresh. It's a very funny story, and anyway, so I can't remember how. I wonder did they did John Tomlinson or Kevin Hopgood? That's it, Kev mm. Hopgood. He was doing some teaching at the at the Kev was doing teaching. I forgot about that. I think you were, yeah, and prob probably introduced me to Andy and John at something. Who then said, "Oh, we're doing this." I think that I might be wrong. They might know better, but I think that was. I was tried out on one of those specials. Yeah. Then John, uh, um, um, Jesus, uh, I'm trying to think who, hang on. That was Andy and John Thompson. Then who, what was the next one? The apartment. I'm trying to remember which I did first. I don't know. I think one I did first and then it came out. The, fir the first one came out second or something like that. But anyway, um, yeah, but that was my kind of introduction. Because I mean, it's straining to remember. That does kind of make sense because if you if you look at the, the the style on the Clegg story, it is more in keeping with that Virgin Games cover. But when you come to the apartment, there, there's there's a, a clear difference in in the style. It's it's there's bits that are a lot looser. Um, you've clearly yeah. thought a bit more about how Dredge uniform works on the page. So I, I I guess it would make sense that one before the other. Yeah, I know it was it was pretty it was. It's all up there in my original art catalogs for people to see, by the way. It's warts and all. I haven't held anything back, and it's, it's pretty bad. Um, Alan, not Alan Grant. Um, uh, um, John Wagner? Um, yeah, John Wagner. Mm. Um, it's funny, because I do think he seemed to hear, Somebody, I don't know if they're flattering me, said that John liked what I was doing, which gave me a boost. Mm. You know? Okay, good. Because, you know, if you can impress him. But he must have been like, oh, I don't know. Anyway, but yeah. <laughs> Wait, it, 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 explain a little bit about your your uh, your working style at the time, because obviously um, you, you you come in in the um, early very early nineties. Um, we're still in that kind of post Bisley phase where uh, painted comics are a thing. Um, how how were you working? Were, you know, was 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 it kind of uh, you know working on one big uh, piece of Bristol board and painting or oh I actually did all of that stuff on black paper oh really wow yeah which is completely moronic <laughs> because yeah because the reason I did it was because I'd gone from I don't know doing chalk drawings on black paper and I thought well this will work and but the problem with that is you put if you're working on black paper as soon as you put a mark down it looks bright just yeah. relatively so you you're bringing up things up to light and you would stop way before they were bright enough because it would look bright compared to everything else it was really really stupid i don't know why i did that but um so I, you know again i learned the hard way because you put that stuff on a on the, on the web offset or whatever the scanners yeah it's got no bright paper it's got nothing to project the color through it was really again i don't it was really crazy I'd obviously done, I think I'd done a Golden Axe cover on black paper and it worked quite pretty well. And, um, but it was really not suited. I think by the time I got to Muzak Killer, I got sorted it out. Was that the next one I did? I think, I don't know. My, I, I, you know, it improved a lot. Yeah. 
Oh no, uh, yeah, I think was it Muzak Killer? But there, there was there was there was Teddy Chopermitz as well. Yeah, that was yeah. I still like that story. And in fact, I've never had the guts to because I work a lot with Tim Burton, and I've never had the guts to show him that. <laughs> I really should have. <laughs> but yeah, that's Gareth. That's the first time I worked with Gareth, and that was brilliant. He was so funny. And I remember it was a seven-page story, and I remember Alan McKenzie going cheeky bastard about Gareth putting in a seven-page story because it it cuts out an advertising page. Yeah. Yeah, but it was, it was, um, I, don't, I don't know when, I know my, my artwork style of that was a huge improvement. I've learned an awful lot and my storytelling was better. Um, I think that might have been between the two Music Killers, was it? I can't remember. I, I know I, Music Killer 1 and Music Killer 2 were right. way, way better. Mm. Uh, but was, I, I guess, I guess Music uh, Killer, the, 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 the first story, I mean, you, you were a music fan, you know, it, it, was, it was some of the... Yeah, early... but funnily enough, not into Garth's music. Oh, really? No, not at all. Uh, like, because I'd get on the phone to him and I'd be like, I don't like that, that music either. Because he was into R.E.M. and all this American... I just did not like that music. I was into... At that time, I was really into all these Camden-based, noisy, like... Not, it was just before grunge and grunge. Hmm. But it was uh, kind of um, Silverfish and... Uh, Sun Carriage and all these little bands in Camden, which were just this massive wall of sound. I absolutely love that music. And then R.E.M. would come in, and to me, they all just sang like they were singing through their nose. I couldn't stand it. And that's that was what Garth really liked. But but what we both really didn't like was the um, you know the Stock Ape, Ape and, and Waterman music of the time. Mm. Absolutely awful. I hated that music. And and that was the X factor of its of its era. That style. Mm. and um, Rick Astley and all that kind of stuff. It's just dreadful packaged music. So it didn't matter that we didn't like the same music as long as we both hated the same music. So that was the thing. That was, that was what was behind it. I mean, it's, yeah. It's, you know. Yeah, so it, it, it just seemed like a story upon which you, you, you were both having an awful lot of fun. I, right, I, yeah. And what's funny is my, my nephew is was uh, 21 this week, his 21st birthday. And my sister bought him, I mean, two music killer pages because I had given her the, a couple of pages years ago. Mm. And it was the one where he comes into his apartment and it's got all the posters on the wall, okay? And she bought him the, the pages either side of that. And, um, and before people think, why didn't I just give them to my sister? She wouldn't have it. I mean, I was like, you can just have them. She's like, no, because then she wouldn't be It'd be me giving him the present, but anyway, that's another story. Um, so, um, but what's fascinating when I was looking at them is because Marty Spock, Muzak Killer, was obsessed with the 20th century, mm. it hasn't dated because the stuff that's in his room looks dated because it's the 20th century, like the TVs and everything, the vinyl record players. It's all very hipster now, which is mm. kind of weird. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's weirdly kind of survived, but it's so violent. I mean, I was like, Jesus, how, how do we get away with it? It's like garroting Christian, what's his face, on the words. It's yeah. just horrendously violent. I don't know how we got away with that. But I guess it's funny. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I love the idea of, of uh, any sort of artist writer collaborating on something, but it sounds like you and Garth had a, a, a lot of fun chatting yeah. about it. Yeah, well, yeah, I didn't, I mean, I couldn't claim to know Garth very well. Um, and he just talked to him on the phone and stuff. Um, but yeah, he could, well, he had, I mean, I had an awful lot of fun. We didn't have to collaborate to get to there. His writing, he had all his fun when he was writing it. And I had a huge amount of fun um, drawing it. It's, mm. it's really, it really was. And my favorite page, actually, my sister wanted it, was um, when Marty goes in and chainsaws, um, the enemy journalist because at the time i used to read the enemy and stephen wells remember stephen wells he was a journalist and there's this style of writing in the enemy which was like this right er at all the time er er you know it's such a such a it's, it was like the equivalent of saying not at the end of the of wayne's world thing it's just this habit and um also uh, you know i'm sure he's a brilliant writer and all the rest of it but he would attack and criticize a lot of the music that I would have liked, right? And I just found him just kind of up as himself. So to have Marty go in and um, dispatch an enemy, 
Well, it's quite funny. I was just, in fact, I have the page there someplace. I haven't put it on my wall yet, but yeah, yeah, that was good fun. It, it, I, I guess at, th at this point, um, in the early nineties, you, you've you've had a lot of the uh, the original droids uh, with the original creators move on. So there's new generation uh, of, of, of artists coming through. Did did you yeah. have in any sense? Uh, or anyway, a, a sense of uh, I'm I'm in now, or was it very much on a case by case basis? Um, it, no, I think I mean I got so I think what makes you feel you're in a good place is when you're given covers to do weirdly, mm, okay? Because you're they're hard, so. Um, of course they're hard. Storytelling in comics is the hardest thing ever. I'm not taking away from that. That is incredibly difficult. But you you have six pages to get it right. Whereas you go in, you know, with Rich Burton and Alan McKenzie at the time, they, Alan especially, seemed to love the covers that I was doing. So I'd go in with, like, I remember a summer special cover or something. He'd be like, in my professional opinion, that's amazing. You know, he just, he really, so I knew I was connecting with them. Um, but so, and I felt I was getting better. And of course, the thing is, it's not that you fit your work when you're learning in public, you get better so quickly that you're like, well, this is way better than what I was doing at the start. So that makes you feel, okay, I'm, I'm locked in here. I'm in. Do you know what I mean? Because so then it's all about the pressure of match, of, of um, just very people that inspired you to go in in the first place are kind of why I ended up leaving in the, in the end because it's just too crushing. It's just, I really think there's some pages at the end of Slain, I hit my stride and that's my style. And, but barely. And then when I, when I got out and went into film, one of the best moments for me was when I saw people um, online having somebody accusing somebody of ripping me off. I was like, wow amazing because i've spent my career ripping people off trying to learn you know what i mean so once you're in you feel okay i'm in now i've got to just be i just want to be i just want to do some really cool stuff you know and and um and telling story you know when you've got a good story drawing comics is definitely the happiest i've ever been in my life in fact the, the next closest is when i've been given storyboards to do in film when I, like i was on a tiny little horror movie and the director's like we need to sort this bit out can you just come up with some stuff for these scenes and that's i just want to get up at four in the morning and work on it that's 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 the happiest i, I ever am is is when i'm telling stories but it can be um it can be um you know i've got some very i you know the people i admire that got that inspired me to come into the industry are so another level it, it can be really frustrating trying to um do work that comes close to that level of you know that kind of level do you, do you think in, in some ways that can um that desire to make your own mark can sometimes uh even hold you back a little bit because you you're, you're constantly thinking about the level that you need to attain um, no, 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 it doesn't. It, it's not that. It's because um, the truth is, once you're once you're drawing, you're just have, trying to tell the story, and you're you're trying to get the pages in. And I was always, le you know, I was always behind. I was too slow, um, and I, I wasn't trying to. I wanted to paint and draw cool stuff, and have it, and 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 still the pages that I love the most. I mean. Uh, you know, I put, I won't sell them. I just, like I've got uh, Occo Count and Gold on the wall here. That's, I love that because it has a lot of my own stuff has come through it. So it's in hindsight often, you often go, okay, I've, I've really managed to, I can't, it's hard to explain. It's not, you're just like, I'm, I'm trying to store it in a cool way possible. And it's, you know, if, if I manage to do that, um, and then even better if it feels like it's mine, it's my own style. I'm finally getting there. But it's, it, yeah, it's, it's, I think when you start out as a comic artist, you're looking for permission for every mark you make 
from another a successful artist who did a mark like that, you know? And um, we're all, well, not all of us, but, you know, as we're all kind of a compendium of all our influences. And what makes it maybe a bit different is that there's a bit of Bolland, there's, there's a bit of Bisley, there's a bit of Fabry, there's a bit of John Bolton, there's a bit of John Waterhouse, the, you know, there's a bit of everything in Frazetta, of course, all thrown in there. Um, and um, really, I think uh, when I left and went into film, then I got my own style because it was I was working digitally. Nobody was working digitally when I started, so I was I sort of didn't have. And also, I was. It's a very different process, and, and you're not you're you're. It's very. Um, not all comic art artists are suited to doing it because your ego gets crushed instantly because you're you're never showing a director what they want and if if you show them what they want they skip to the next thing they need they don't waste time because they're worried you know and um you it's you go from bringing in some pages to alan and mckenzie and him going oh, that's fantastic to showing something to director and then just like why did you do that i just like I, what like just no interest like because for film it's about being appropriate and then it's a bit about being cool but you know it's not it, the the art is not the final product it's a design you're designing so anyway um no, i i because I'm, I'm interested about the whole thing because you mentioned about how um uh deadlines have always been pushed because you know fully painted out where it, 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 it always feels like comics created a rod for its own back in the, um, you know, there was this hunger for fully painted artwork, but yeah. the schedules didn't change, you know, they were still expected no. to produce it. No, uh, yeah, but it was the work that got me in there and I still love it. I still absolutely love it and I have no interest in the other stuff. Not really, I have some of it. I just, there's something about painted work. I mean, it's, I mean, if you, you know, if you see Sergio Topi, his work is just amazing. But that's another level of attention to artistry that is way beyond what it needs to be to tell the story. And I will go back, I bought a Sergio Topi's Life of Pope Paul II, just because it's Sergio Topi, you know, because it's amazing. Or, you know, some of those European artists, you know, or Segreles, you know, that, that painted work. It's, I just love that work. That's what I love to have around and go back to. And I know that um, it can be criticized for being too much, uh, but I don't care. That's what I love. That's what, like, when I saw Bisley Slane, I was like, Jesus Christ, it's amazing. And of course, the other thing about, about Simon Bisley's work is he's not spending that long enough. He's just a genius. You know what I mean? It's not, it's, it's just, he's, you know, it's like I've, there's some artists who I won't bother saying who they are, who are very famously fast, but I'm not interested in their work. It's just boring. They have stock faces and stock ways of doing things that they go to. So it has to be an amazing story then, which of course you, you know, but I, I, I there's great writers out there and that's not enough for me in comics. I, I find it too frustrating if, if I don't love the artwork. And if I love the artwork, I find the comic hard to read because I want to go in and just paint because it's inspiring. So I can get about five pages into Electro Assassin and I'm like, ooh, I want to draw this. This is just so exciting. You know, but anyway, yeah. I know it's, it's kind of an era where I think, I know um, Dave Bishop was talking about the seas of mud, wasn't he? The, You'd open the drawers, all these brown, brown. <laughs> it must have been frustrating, but you know. I don't know. You you um you came to the rescue on uh, Ultimate Riddle, which was one of the Batman Judge Dredd yeah. crossovers that Carl Critchlow had been uh, had been painting. I mean, yes. That uh, I, I did a, a video for it for the 2000 YouTube and and. The, the slightly convoluted history of uh, all those strips and, and you know, there was Carl yeah. behind on that one. Um, uh, Glenn was massively behind on uh, uh, on the uh, the other one that he was doing, which ended up being the last one to be published. And uh, yeah. 
was this literally kind of like you get a phone call from 2000 AD? We need you to. Do I said, oh, no way am I doing it. They gave me three weeks to do 15 pages, and I was used to doing two pages a week. And I was like, no. And then, then um, DC. Look, to be perfectly honest, I hate when people say that because I'm lying usually. But I'm, to be perfectly honest, um, I really want to do Batman. I would have loved to do Batman. And just a chance to do Batman is like amazing to me. I, would, I still would love to do it. And um, so I was like, this is the chance to do Batman. I've got to do five pages a week, right? I was like, I'm going to mess this up. And that would be my introduction to DC Comics, would be messing up this thing. So what happened was they said, we are doing these Batman Master Series trading cards. Okay, so if you do this for us, we'll give you a big batch of them and you can show us your Batman. And that's what I did. So then I looked at Carl's style and I was like, I ain't doing that because it will take me forever. Because he's, you know, I just will do this much more blocky style, more busily, obviously. Just, it's just quicker, faster, bang the damn thing out. I had no, I mean, I'm not making excuses because I loved doing it, I enjoyed it. But it was a, you know, bang it out, three weeks, 15 pages, fastest I've ever worked. And then I did get to do 30 of those trading cards and show my skill level when I could spend a little bit more time. And then I thought, good, this will lead me into doing um, some stuff for DC and Batman or Batman Trade or whatever, but it didn't, it didn't go anywhere. <laughs> so so I, I obviously did, they probably were like, no, nah, we don't want that. If they looked at, and, and poor Carl must've been like, oh, this, because he could have done with a, an artist or me paying more attention to his style, but I couldn't. He, his style is too, it's very, it's, it's beautiful, and it's, it, but it's, it looks, it's time consuming. You know, it would be like, um, we're all in, massively influenced by Bisley, but like I couldn't do what Greg does, what Greg Staples does. That, that detail, that level, I can't, I can't work like that. I just, I, I sort of, what happens to me is as soon as I'm bored, my, it's like a gate goes up over from one side of my brain to the other. And it goes from the bit that's good at drawing and painting to the bit that's okay because it's been in the company of the one that's good. Do you know what I mean? So it's able to do it, but it's not very good. And then I have to keep on that side all the time or, uh, I just my work goes get really dull. I can see it. I can see. I can see when I worked on Star Wars doing the costumes. I can lay out. I did five hundred characters in a in a year, and I can almost like a graph see where I was bored in the style. The style just goes, and then oh, I'm interested there. I'm bored there. I'm interested there. It's like a, I'm, I'm, it's a Jekyll and Hyde. It's you, very boring Jekyll and Hyde. <laughs> when you did um, Book of the Dead, I mean, some of those pages. Uh, you're, you're clearly investing a hell of a lot of time in something. Yeah, I think. I can't, yes, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. So all, all, all the depictions of, you know, um, yeah. ancient Egyptian headdresses. Yeah, I loved it. Yeah, I absolutely loved it. And I have to say, I was really disappointed at the... I loved what Mark Miller did, building up the story and the whole thing. And then it became a... Then um, um, it turned into a big slugfest, a big fisticuffs action kind of thing which is probably exactly what was needed but I felt a little bit like uh, I would have preferred a little bit more of the I, I don't know it's just a bit more use of the um, ancient Egypt uh, you know environment and by the way it's very much ancient Egypt I know somebody was criticizing me for that Egypt's not that's not very Egyptian I was like yeah it's meant to be yeah I mean you know, had, Gareth had the Irish judge with drinking Guinness and the, you know, it's never rolled. I mean, that, 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 that's a whole different podcast, to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Multiple hours. Um, yeah. But yeah. I, it, no, but what, okay, but what I mean is it was based on the pharaohs. What I'm saying is the look, the feel of it was we were going to the, where the pharaohs are. It wasn't meant to be a modern Egypt. No more than, you know, that's what I mean. Anyway. But I mean, this, uh, it's all kind of, 
continue and then you get work on slain which i guess was must have been quite something considering it was it was Bisley's work on slain that had really in, in, in and fabry and and fabry as well of course yeah um was uh was this a moment of yeah finally or oh crap yeah. I've, this is the moment no this is the moment finally and then i think treasures of, i mean there's some good stuff in queen of witches but um our and uh, the Boudicca story, um, but I kind of was trying to develop a style. It's too colourful though, I don't, I don't really... But by the time I got to Treasures of Britain, I think I'd kind of, you know, got a good level of skill for drawing slain, you know, and the level of detail. Um, but yeah, that was heaven. I loved doing that. Absolutely loved it. Um, what, what 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 was it about the the, the series? Because I I know that um you know that kind of phase of of slain uh, has its fans, it has its detractors, but clearly you were having fun with it. You were in, invested. You were interested in what you were doing. Yeah, I mean the thing is, you I I mean you know you, I get on the phone with Pat, and I, I remember once um, I think I might have said this before, but. I said, oh no, he said, are you busy? And I was like, no, no. And I remember I was sitting upstairs. I was looking for something in the room upstairs. And I remember, <laughs> I said, no, I'm on my own actually. And I remember the stars were out and all the lights in the house were dark by the time I got off the phone. Because we would just talk and talk and talk and talk and we can do it. And Pat was fantastic to work with. I loved it. But, um, and again, some of the happiest times of my life were sitting in my studio listening to music and drawing slang it was absolutely just your life couldn't get better but i couldn't pay my bills because i was too slow <laughs> so um you know and the other thing that was unfortunate about treasures of britain the last slain story is that they changed the format of 2000 ad and we had to wrap the story up early or pat had to wrap it which he did fine but it needed another two episodes it needed it needed a, bit, a little bit more air at the end, and um, but it was great. I mean, I loved doing it, and I still regard that some of the best work I've ever done. And um, so yeah, and of course, you know, you're the crushing weight of Fabry and Bisley on your shoulders um, when you're doing it. But it's so enjoyable to do that you can kind of shake that off, um, you know. You're inspired by them, but also I, th I think what you have to kind of make a decision not to be intimidated. But then what you do is you just get on with telling the story. And, and, and I was getting better at drawing and better at storytelling. And my sense of color was getting better through a lot of different experiments. Um, I was finally kind of settling on a, a nicer palette, um, which I still, in, you know, I mean, I'm doing at the moment I'm getting involved in the Wizards of the Coast magic stuff and that grave digger thing. Where is it? Anyway, I'm signing these cards, but it's still that palette. I mean, that's, I took, I've taken that then into the film industry. I've taken that palette that I've developed, um, I think, which is obviously all, all my, some of all my influences still, but I was beginning to kind of lock down a, a, a a style that might have been more mine maybe i don't know because you, you you mentioned about you know by the time you got to the end of your run on slain that you know the, the the last however many pages you felt that you'd really kind of finally reached that point reach that point where you think yeah. this is my style what 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 was the essence of your style if what, you look at if you if if if, if you look at this, the beginning of the, of the story, there's Arthur's stabbing Mordred with a giant sword. Well, it's the, um, the moon sword or whatever. Yeah. And then I've repeated the same panel at the end. And it's, the one at the end is much chunkier and simpler and easy. And it's not as, I wasn't drawing like this. I was doing big chunky strokes and, and filling up the, the panel with more pleasing pattern shapes you can literally see the difference I, I, the, I, I much prefer the style at the end and also Oko I changed them to a different looking character because I was afraid to change first of all I was doing it was you know you could I was like 
what Glenn was doing and then what Mark Bisley was doing is like, oh God, can I really do my own one? And um, I mean, if I had my time back again, I would have loved to just go, fuck it, I'm just going to do my own style. But again, you're intimidated. You seem to feel like you don't have permission to almost. So by the end, I had he looked different. He'd got long hair and completely like oily, greasy, long hair. He looked completely, looked much different. Um, which is bonkers, by the way, that we get away with that in 2008. But you can, well, I'm just going to make it look different. It looks, it's like, it's like changing an actor out in the middle of a series. And just, ah, that's it. I, I, I remember you did a, um, you did a star scan which was split up into four parts and put on like the back cover of 2000 AD, which was, which was a Vucco. Um, yeah, yeah, but you know what that was? What was that? I found that yesterday because it's weird. This is weird timing because I haven't looked at, I was up in my attic looking for back issues of 2000 AD because I sold one of uh, the Andersons back. And I wanted to send a copy to the uh, collector in America. And I've got loads of stuff up here on my shelves, but I've got boxes of, you know, multiple. I tend to keep one or two up here and then I'll keep multiples, whatever. My studio is full of books. So I just try to lighten the load. And um, hang on, I've strayed away. What were you saying again? What was I saying? Um, about the, the, the... Oh, yeah, 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 that thing. So I found one of the copies and it had this quarter picture of Rocco. I was like, what the hell is this? All right. That was done for charity and sold at the Tribal Gathering Music Festival, as far as I remember. And Steve McManus bought it, right? I think. And then I remember him, like, I, I can't think he bought it for like 500 quid or something. And then I can only think that he thought, well, this is, may as well use it as a stir. But it was, is he smoking a joint? Yeah, it's like it was meant for a music festival. It wasn't really meant for the back of 2000 AD, but it was like, all right. I see, he's, yeah. he's, he's spoken a joint and he's got a can of, I think, red stripe in his other Yeah, no, it's, it's a, a thinly veiled version of Stella, I think. Oh, right, so, okay. Yeah, yeah, but it was meant, the whole idea was, if you, it has these um, signs saying northeast or south, or, and it's meant to have been a piece that would be in the middle of the tribal gathering festival telling people where to go. So it's all because sitting there with a, with a beer and a spliff telling people where to go it was not really <laughs> but obviously it was deemed suitable for for uh, 2008 but yeah it's funny you should say because it's just come i just saw it you know two days ago and it was yeah like, no, no weird weird um yeah, very, i want to move on from uh, well let's, let's talk a little bit uh, just a little bit more about slain because as you see yeah. you had long conversations with pat um the, the, the entire foundation of the series is uh, Irish myths and legends. Yeah. Um, how much uh, of your time, how much of your energy went into uh, following Pat's lead on the research and things like that? Or was it, was it you know, I'll let Pat, I'll let the script deal with that. This no, Pat, I would never interfere with the script. I would talk to Pat about that stuff. And I had an uncle who was a historian, Irish historian. So, and Pat had his book of Irish curses, which he wrote. My uncle did a book called The Book of Irish Curses, which Pat actually coincidentally had. Um, but no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to, except for chats about stuff. I wouldn't, um, you know, I just want to see, I want to see what Pat's going to write. I'm not going to interfere with that. And there was a beautiful, he did get the cadence of the Irish language really well. I don't mean, I mean, Irish use of English is what I mean. I mean, in fact, the back of Bisley's Horn God, where they give this pronunciation guide, that drives me crazy because that is not correct. Oh, it's really? Not, no, but it, it's this in Chirnanog, and it's not, it's just Chirnanog, it's not Chirnanog. It's really grating the way they describe that. I don't know who told them that. But, but they, I remember like when Slavfeg's talking about it's a good time, you know, when Slane and him are speaking in this kind of, medieval it's it's very like Thomas Kinsella or uh, one of the Irish poets who wrote in English but but it's got an Irish sound to it so I loved all that yeah it was very familiar I mean one thing I was absolutely rubbish at those interlaced strap work I just thought that would be easy for me because you know, I'm Irish here we go and I find myself trying to draw it I'm like I just can't do this I'm really crap at it I'm really really not good at it so that was a problem you know, I'm still trying to put that on everything but <laughs> 
Yeah. Let, let's, let's move on beyond 2008 because I, I want to briefly talk about Digitech because um, again, oh, yeah. as a as a teenager in the 90s, um, Overkill was was uh, the worst named uh, comic ever. Yeah, it was per- it was perfect for me. Like, yeah, but it was a terrible name though. <laughs> Overkill was like you're inviting, you know, commentary. So, but yeah, okay, that was an interesting period. Yeah, yeah. And, and a lot of people are coming out now. I've because a few collectors have bought artwork because it's all up. And now I sound like I've gone and in my book I wrote a book. It just I don't care if people look at it or not. Doesn't bother me. But as it, I did that and then forgot about it for twenty years. And then it's like there's a generation of grown up that knew it, and they're now coming out and, and asking me for the um, covers. In fact, I just sold the cover for Overkill 2 to somebody, this guy Adrian, I don't know, his comic book toolbox. And um, so he just sent me a link that somebody dug out of me on Motormouth children's TV show with Dave Gibbons. Do you remember that? Yeah, and, yeah, it's all right. Yeah, and I somehow, had brought that overkill cover. And that was what was on the desk. Yeah. So it was great because Adrian bought it and I again I had done it as an inspiration piece. It wasn't meant to be a cover. And then I wasn't big enough so I had to add all these bits on the on the edge and glue them on and paint paint the rest of it. But yeah Digitech was uh, an interesting one. I uh, first of all I can't stand that name. I think it's absolutely terrible. Just I thought it was so it really sounded like a calculator. Because it was originally called RAM, I think. RAM, R-A-M. I thought that was much better. And um, yeah, it was, a, it was a story that grew. It, it started off, because it was Andy and, Tom, and John, Andy Lanning, and that was meant to be like 20 pages. And then it just grew and grew and grew and grew. And yeah, I'm not, I wasn't, it wasn't my, I have, there's some great panels, but it wasn't some, I had to rush that. It was really not my best, best work at all. Because it, it, it was, I mean, it was interesting what Marvel UK were trying to do at the time, I guess, you know, create their own shared universe. But I mean, how, how much were you in on these plans? Was it just, here's, here's a job, here's something to do? It just, it sort of snowballed. I had no intention of doing a 120 page story. I thought I was doing like 12 page, then it was 24, then it was bang. And I was like, now I'm in doing this. Um, it's just, again, the problem is that the guys are really into film and sci-fi and Terminator 2 came out and suddenly everything was people turning themselves into things. And I just found there was a problem with the, it needed, I mean, I was trying to be a sci-fi with my bright colors, but I just, it wasn't, it needed a bit more, I don't know, when you look at it, it needs to be a bit more sci-fi than that. It's, it, it was a very filmic script. You could feel that the guys were really into their movies and stuff. And I'm not so sure I did justice to their vision, shall we say. Um, but, but it was okay. It was all right. And then, you know, people, there's some great, I really like some of the covers I did. And there's a couple of panels when Deathlock turned up. They're pretty cool. And, um, but yeah, it's, you know, I don't know, not my... I mean, it's, 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 it's... It's interesting to me that you know you you've done this uh, pretty long run on Slain. Um, you've done stuff like Digitech, and and then just at the time when you know, as you say, you you'd got into your stride in terms of your style. You move from comics to movies. Yeah. Do you want to explain a little bit how that came to be? Yeah, because um, it's Brendan McCarthy's fault. Because <laughs> Brendan, no, what happened was Brendan used to do a lot of work with Steve Barron. The director and Brendan was going off to us but I think he was going off to Australia to learn Mad Max which eventually came out 20 years later and he wasn't around for day for Steve and Steve asked him would he recommend somebody else and for some reason he recommended me or through Steve Cook I think I'm not sure and um, I went in and did some work for Steve Barron on Merlin uh, the TV series and the thing that made you, I was a very slow comic artist, but I was a very fast concept artist. Because I was so used to, from slaying, trying to go as fast as possible. And um, so I developed techniques that would 
you know, you could get a visual, a, a visual out really, really quickly. So I suddenly was quite fast and also used to just coming up with ideas. Because the thing that Pat, Pat's a brilliant comic book writer, but he's going to leave the details up to us the artists, you know, the, so we do our research about the visual side, side of things. And so I also had a ready obsession with shapes in costume and things like that. So yeah, so that, that was, I think what happened was I started doing a bit of that and it's weird because the first thing that happened is I got, um, Costume designer ringing me up, giving me shit for like, oh, I could draw, you know, I don't have time to draw that. And then production designer rang me up and he was complaining about what I was doing, like undermining him. And of course you should, that should put me off, but it didn't put me off. I just thought, okay, there's some politics here you need to be very careful of. But in the end, you have to figure out exactly what your, your job is. And the thing is, what telling stories with comics does is you're, you're you're obsessing on each panel is this saying what it needs to say is it readable or you know um and especially painted comics because you're you you it's you have to strive for clarity all the time within all that painted where every part of the surface is accounted for that's the only way i can put it if you you don't have the ready shortcuts that working in black and white gives you like thicker black lines and certain whatever. I mean, of course you can use them if you can use, you know, if they're available for certain panels. But, um, all of that prepared me very well for being a concept artist. And um, also I thought I'll buy a computer because I'll see, if, will this be useful? Because I bet they're going to ask you to change colors and things. And once I started working digitally, I was like, wow, this is amazing. This is just crazy. And the most important, Thing that happened i was broke right i was burned out i was i looked at slain and i was like still not as good as bisley and fabry and um, and Bolland and i'm never going to be as good as them it's, it's, it's a little bit I, it sounds like i really feel sorry for myself but i just thought i just need to get out from under this and make my own try to do my own thing so i didn't intend giving up comics forever i just thought i just need a break and I had the slain, the next Children of Lear slain story, Pat had sent it to me. And it's a beautiful story. And I just couldn't do it. I just, I, I, I started, in fact, I did a few pages digitally and I printed them out. They looked awful, really bad, because I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't, like, again, in the same way that when you work on black paper, when you put a mark down, you're like, wow, look at that, it's bright, but it isn't bright. When you work digitally, you're so amazed that the thing can do anything. Like, Jesus, look, this looks like a drawing. That you you get a little blindsided by that. You don't realize it's not good enough. Um, and it took a while. It didn't take that long, but for me to get it to work with my style, which, um, so then also you just get paid a lot more. You, I mean, you get paid a lot more if you're a comic artist who does five or six pages a week or even five pages a day or something. Some of them are blasting the stuff out. They do very, very well. But when you're struggling to get two pages a week, you just can't pay your bills. So I was like, okay, I'll try this for a while. And then what really pulled me completely over was, of course, I was obsessed with Star Wars when I was a kid. And then I got hauled into the Star Wars art department. I mean, you talk about good timing. I didn't have any connections in the film industry. I just posted a portfolio to the fan PO box for Star Wars. And Ian McKay, the concept artist, was thinking of leaving. And Doug Chang said, well, could you, you know, we need somebody to replace you. And they said, let's go through the slush pile. So they just got all the portfolios and went through them and went, ooh, this guy's cool. And they called me. And that was, that's how I got on Star Wars, which is extremely fortunate. But that, I absolutely love that. And, and I love doing that. And I mean, the film was whatever, but um, I really loved working on episode two. And um, it was the first time I was working and it was my work. Because I wasn't, I was love film, but I wasn't influenced by Ralph McQuarrie, um, Joe Johnson, and, or Doug himself. 
or any of the film Ron Cobb, any of the film concept artists. I mean, I love Sid Mead, of course, everybody does, but my influences were from comics, not from film. So I land in film and I just bring my comic sensibility, which is then disguised because I am now working digitally. So it doesn't look like I'm doing what I was doing for at least at the beginning. And also I was really fast for, for, for a concept artist because I was banging this stuff out digitally. It was so fast. So I kind of just never went back. That's, that's really the, the, the truth of it, you know? I mean, I remember posting back the script. Uh, I felt really bad, but I was like, I have to, you know? But, yeah. Because, I mean, again, you, you sort of talk about uh, good timing and, and transitioning to working with, with computers. That, that, that Again, that, that was like the perfect time. You, you talk to people like um, uh, Dave Gibbons and uh, somebody like Disraeli, and they were looking at, you know, using bringing computers in in the mid in, in the in the mid 90s and it if if you're ahead of the curve in some uh, ahead of the curve on something like that then yeah. you, you're you know you, you've got an advantage over what everybody else is doing who's still working traditionally i guess um I'm not sure you have a, an advantage in comics because it, it you get so much for free painting traditionally um I mean, I actually remember talking to Dave Gibbons at a convention about this stuff. Oh, he bought a computer, watch it. And, and it's that classic thing they say when writers meet, they talk about their computers, they don't talk about writing. Suddenly we're talking about what computer did you got? Got 1800 and blah, blah, blah. Um, but look, the, the truth is I get bored really quickly and I'm always trying to do things in a new way. And when I started drawing on computers, I mean, I was doing, I drew all the first, batch of work on Star Wars on a computer. Doug Chang didn't realize they were done on the computer because they were thinking they were ahead of the curve because they started bringing in a computer to ch make changes to visuals. Whereas I was like, why didn't you just draw with it? What, what, why would you be doing that? So I, I like just, and, and the first thing I did actually, because it was, was the Sonic cover for, for not for, for Fleetway, the Sonic the Hedgehog comic, because it was so different to what I would normally do. Like I would never do Sonic. That, and also I was trying to impress my kid who was really into Sonic the Hedgehog. So I was like, okay, I'll do this on a computer. So I painted and it took me two weeks to paint one picture because I just couldn't figure, out, figure it out. It took me, but then I'd figured it out. Okay, that's how Photoshop and then Painter and whatever. But, um, you know, I like to mix it up. I like to do things in lots of different ways. But I'm well aware that in the wrong hands, the computer can kill art, the artwork. Because you, you know, I'm not trying to get a computer to um, look like paint. I, I try to get it to make marks I like and strokes I like. It, and that tends to look more painterly. But, you know, I've even, now I do an awful lot of 3D and I do animation. I do everything, anything. I do, I, I'll do anything to st stop being bored basically that's my thing so you know is that, is that one of the the appeals of working in movies that it, it it's every new movie is a different kind of set of challenges different way of thinking about things um yeah i mean no you kind of Okay, so as a concept artist, you don't know what the movie's going to be like until you're sitting or well, standing, because I stand at the desk in the art department, and then it's too late. Like, oh, God. So um, it comes back to the same thing. It's you're hoping to work on films with good stories, and they're very often not. So then you think, okay, I'll work on a director who's going to be good to work with. So I work with Tim Burton a lot and you know people complain about some of Tim's films but he's fantastic to work for. He's just really good fun to work. He doesn't like I don't pretend to know him by the way. I worked with him for 10, 15 years and you know worked upstairs in his house while he's downstairs but he says very little. So I'm not trying to be like oh me and Tim were like that. We're not um but I he doesn't say very much and I loved I love working um, for, for him because, and, but that's an example. Like if you work with him, he wants you to just draw stuff. I, I mean, digitally, but just draw it. Don't get into the 3D stuff. 
but I'll often do both. I'll be drawing for him and then I'll be doing the 3D stuff as well because um, compliments about your drawn work are cheap. People go, oh, I love your, oh, I love your drawing work. Like you feel like art directors in, a, in an art department would love if you rocked up with an easel and some paint. And they'd be, oh, that's great, I love it. And then they can ignore it, right? So what you do, what we've done, and Rob Bliss as well, is we shove ourselves as far down the um, pipeline as we can get by doing as, all right, so if somebody ignores my work because they say, well, it's just a sketch. Okay, I will make it look photo real then. So you don't have that as an excuse. And for selling sets, I will do VR 360s in the headset, all that kind of stuff, because, you know, it's about selling a space. It's a very different, it's, it, I'm, I am using all my stuff I've learned for comics to quickly get visuals out, but the visual is not the end product. It's a design. It, it's a design for something else. It's, 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 um, the, the motivation is different. You're trying to sell a design. You're trying to sell a space or a mood or an atmosphere. You're not selling the picture. You know? I'm fascinated by this notion of kind of having to carve out your own space within a, a film production, you know, kind of, putting your stamp on things while also making sure that people are aware of, of what you're doing, that they can't ignore it. I mean, that's, that's, that's fascinating, almost like an internal market. Well, it's not that, I mean, what happens eventually is you work with people who don't, who you just love working with. And um, it's more because, um, you know, the best people, like, uh, you, know, you know, the best sculptors are the best, like, um, they will take of quite a loose drawing because I here's the thing I don't do loose drawings I do minimal drawings they're very specific if you look at my style ever since slain it's it's never it, it may look quick and minimal but it's very particular I want that those exact line shapes they're not just flicked off randomly and and um but the fact that they are photoreal in, in, and some people will use as an excuse, oh, it's just a sketch. Whereas the best sculptors and the best creatives you ever work with are the ones who bring, the level they add to it improves what you've done. They get the point, they understand it, and they make it better in, when they realize it, say, is a 3D model or in the next stage. They never divert away from it. And often less good people either choose the fact that it's a sketch to ignore what you've done or else they're not capable of doing it and use that as an excuse. Oh, it's just a sketch. So, um, you know, I've had years working this stuff out. I mean, design, being a concept artist for the film industry is, is you have to figure out what the design is and often the design is what is the director like? Do you know what I mean? What's he going to like? Look, what's he, what's he worried about? You know, that's the other thing. Because directors are worried all the time, and they don't make decisions until they really have to. You know, so there's all these other things that you have to feed in, and it's you. I for some reason I'm wired to be able to use computers pretty well, and I learned that stuff pretty quickly. I think it's because I'm not able, capable of working unless I'm organised. So I'm. I, I just can't deal with it. It's like when I did the art books for Fantastic Beasts, I had to collate the work of 60 artists from all over the world. And I'm able to do it because I, I, I'm, I'm quite organized. You know, I, I'm only quite organized because I'm, I cannot work with chaos. I just can't. You know? um, it doesn't mean that organizing comes natural. It just means it's the only way I kind of work. And that led, lead, means I'm able to use computers and learn 3D software and animation and things like that pretty well because it's all very organized. So, um, but anyway, straight away from what you were asking me. What <laughs> no, 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 it's absolutely great. It's absolutely great. <laughs> well, I, what, what I wanted to, to, uh, to ask was, was um, how working in movies has changed you as an artist because, you know, you, you, when you started uh, in the movie industry, I think you said earlier, you know, your um com background in comics was an advantage how have you evolved as an artist oh it, it, it's okay so uh, it's it, the right 
it's, it, I've evolved, I've gone sideways and I've tailored the way I work to the project. So um, I worked on Jack the Giant Slayer or whatever that dumb movie was. And um, so we worked for months on giant designs. And Rob Bliss did these incredibly beautiful, funny designs and he did a lot of 3D sculpting. And Howard, um, uh, one of the other artists, he, um, Jesus, Howard's gonna kill me. His name just jumped out of my head. His surname has just dropped out of my head. Um, anyway, he did these beautiful 3D models and beautiful sculpts and uh, Howard Swindell. Um, and really amazing and you'll believe that the thing is in the room and then i'm drawing in the traditional comic style that i've used to and the difference is this is that i will collect one idea per drawing okay so i'm saying if these giants will the armor if they're fighting humans should the armor be facing downwards because nobody's going to clobber them on the head you know what i mean that kind of thing you're asking asking a question but you're working for a director who doesn't even want to make the film it felt like he just wasn't engaged so um, after months, they were like, can you please tell us, pick, you know, we've got all these giant designs, tell us which are your favorite giant designs. And he picked 11 Howards, one of Rob's, and none of mine, right? I was like, okay. Because he used the fact that Howards just, you felt they're in the room with you, right? So in that case, there's no point in me providing comic book style drawings because the director is just going to be blind to them. He's not even going to look at them. So I thought, okay, so I immediately on that job, so I better learn 3D. So I started learning ZBrush and sculpting. So then even within that job, I'd learned enough to do some 3D sculpts and turntables. And then I carried that on to my next job. And so, um, so I added that ability to do 3D modeling and sculpting because you get fed up of people um, rejecting your designs because it's sitting next to one that's way more finished. And that happens all the time. So you get things being selected because they're the most real. And when I worked in the US, I worked for a few years in San Francisco with Doug Chang's Ice Pink. I used to get some of the designs that were done and they're really, really super real on Beowulf. And I'd redraw it in line and show it to Doug and go, that's the design. Yeah, you happy with that? Because that's not a good design. It just looks real. And that's what Zemeckis would pick. He's another director who would just pick everything if, as long as it looked like it was real. He'd pick the more real, not the better. So in the, in the end, you don't just go, okay, you know, if you can't beat him, join him. And so I learn. And so I did learn. And I enjoy that stuff anyway. So the project I just did before lockdown, had everything. So the direct, it's for TV series, which I'm not allowed to talk about. And um, the designer, uh, Chris Seegers, he's great. He's like, love your sketches. I mean, I, I do, um, what I do is I get a script. I do this first. Yeah. I just go through it and doodle, right? Actually, I shouldn't have showed you that one. Hang on. Here's for Dumbo. Dumbo. So I just do doodles like this. In a book, right? And then you just sit there with the script, collecting the script. And those drawings are not done for anybody. They're just for me, because I can't remember scripts. So that helps me um, to remember the script. And then I remember I hadn't worked with Chris before and I showed him that notebook and he was like, this is great, you barely need to do more than this. <laughs> it's like, okay, I think I better do a bit more. So what I would do is I would get the script, I uh, a whole, you know, notebook full of this stuff. And then we just go through it and I would redo each one really quick black and white sketching the way I love to do. And then also get the locations, the actual models, 3D models of the vehicles that were from the time, all that kind of stuff, and do these super high end visuals as well. And do, and I love working like that. So it's not that my work has become super high end 3D visuals, it's that I do it all. And, and then I work on a broad kind of um, front, depending on the, on the particular film. So that, I mean, that's what, I'm, you know, that's, it's, it's not that, 
it's I've evolved as an artist by adding things to my skill set rather than changing so much. You know, is that sense of of storytelling of the, you know the things you you were picking up in 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 the cartoon center, the stuff you learned on two thousand AD? Do you still get a sense that that is with you? That is still playing a part? Absolutely, completely. And the most important thing is, what is the story? What story am I tr trying to say here? So when you're a comic artist, you're like, is that panel telling the thing that the script wants you to say? And when you're doing concept art, you're saying, what's the, this character's purpose? And then when you're reading the script, you're like, oh, you know, good scripts are, are clear and characters are motivated. And we've had scripts, it's fascinating when you get another writer in who does a rewrite, who's a better writer, and suddenly everything's motivated correctly. The same stuff is happening, but everything's motivated better. Same thing with, this, with the, with the um, I'm looking for design narrative. So you're like, what am I trying to say here? And, and very often it's quite subtle and not what people think. So on Fantastic Beasts, um, I worked with Stuart Craig, who's just a genius production designer. And we did, I designed everything inside Newt's case. I don't know if you saw it, but he goes down into the case and he goes into this world where it's all, um, where he keeps the creatures when he's, it's like a, it's not, we weren't allowed to use the word TARDIS, but it's sort of, you know, a bigger, bigger insight than that. And um, the, the, the design sensibility that we went for was, I had done some very elaborate devices that Newt had for navigating this space. And we showed it to JK Rowling and she, she came back and said, he's not that good a, uh, uh, a wizard. He cares more about the animals than being a good wizard. Or like, okay, that's, that's your narrative. That's where you go from. Once you know that, we're off. So now when you design everything in this case, all the environments look, must look a little bit ham-fisted, like all banged together. So also it's 1927. So what was around at the time? Okay, Wild West shows and found references for Wild West shows where you could see that the, these awnings hang, hanging up that were fir trees all painted, but they'd obviously been used a lot. So they're hanging and they'd holes in them and they would have looked amazing at one point, but now they're a bit broken up. So we went for this arch theatricality so that when you saw it, you're, it, it, it looked theatrical and not quite real, but it looked like it was attempting to be real, right? But here's the subtlety. It couldn't look like, even though it was very influenced, like the um, panoramas that you'd see in, a, in the Natural History Museum. Because if it looked too much like that, the audience would stop working. They'd go, oh, it's a panorama in a Natural History Museum. Do you know what I mean? So you have to, you have to ca gather all of that stuff. And that's why working with Stuart Craig is amazing because he gets into all that. He's, he has those conversations and he thinks about all of that with me, which is fantastic. So then you, you, you're, you're hitting all these notes and that, that, that's equivalent to when I was a comic artist, like, is this telling the story with the feel that I want? It's the same stuff. You're going, what's the, what story am I trying to tell? That's, that's what it is is about unfortunately when you start as a comic artist the story is i want to be as cool as bisley and fabry and bolton and bolland you know and mcmahon and and, and sinkovich and that is the kind of over a thing over everything that as you get better you you um you shake that off so yeah i, I, I kind of want to draw things to a close a little bit but, but just talking about um the fact that having chatted earlier well, at the beginning of this of this uh, episode about um the the kind of shock of of uh, of, of star wars as a uh, as a thing when you were when you were you know, eight or eight or nine yeah. and then to work on uh, is, two of episode the films two and episode seven right yeah um I, I'm, I'm interested how uh, you feel about that experience um, when, you know, having, having worked on 2008, which was something that, you know, you remember when you were a kid, wh whether it was, it's been a, a, a good experience being involved in, in that or whether you've, I guess, you, have you had to stop being a fan in order to work on them? No, what, <clears throat> what happens is 
No, because um, no, not at all. Um, because I got the job on Star Wars, and then the first day, I had to wait till four o'clock until America woke up to get you know to find out what I was going to be doing, and um, so I was like, oh Jesus, and because I'm sitting there, get I'm. And, and then I thought, I can't be nervous, can't be nervous. You're just going to have to just not be nervous about this. It's like, you, it's like your brain just goes up to a level of nervousness and breaks and just like, you just don't, okay, just gonna have to do it. Because you can't. And, and this is the secret is, what is the story I need to tell here? That's all that it matters because then everything else just gets pushed away. And, um, but then the first thing that Doug asked me to do was the Sith. So I was like, wow, that's, I mean, that's an amazing thing to do. And then that, the fifth drawing I did became Asajj Ventress, which is this big popular character. It became this whole other thing that way beyond my control. And um, so, no, you don't, I mean, the problem is that I don't think any of the new ones match the first two. The, you know, um, I know it's such a, cliche but new hope and empire are just masterpieces i mean they're just amazing um so uh and for episode two it was fantastic because it was myself and ian mccade really just two of us doing all these characters by the time episode seven rolled around it just became a just an army of concept artists and it felt um I was working here in London and you'd be working on something and then the next day a whole batch of the same, you know, the guys in America would do their, and it's just, I just, my metaphor, which I'm probably boring people with this, it felt like doing a kind of a mixture between a, a I don't know, a beauty pageant and a hundred meter dash at the same time, you know, trying to do a hundred meter dash in high heels or something. It's just, it just, it was just, and there are some amazing artists and that you're trying to compete with them. Whereas on episode two, I was I had Ian McKay, who's just godlike. He's so amazing. And but Ian is um, he immediately takes you under his wing and then does this what I'm saying. He goes, What's the story of this? And he always does things from a the, the like he's an amazing illustrator, but he also teaches you to look at things a little sideways. So, so if, you, if you have to do an amphibious creature, instead of doing green and blues, let's do pink. You know, do, let's do the opposite. You know, it, for Darth Vader, when he's a young man, let's make, put him in white robes instead of black robes. You know, that kind of thing. So, um, but yeah, it was a really special time. I mean, I was, for a fanboy, I was, you know, um, you know, I stayed at the ranch, which is ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, that, that's pretty cool as things go. Yeah, yeah, that's, and I knew it was special at the time, and boy, do I know it was special now since that all ended. So, I mean, yeah, it was a magical, magical time. It's, it's interesting how many um, 2000 AD artists have ended up working on, on, on these big, because it's Glyn Dillon, obviously, yeah. um, Chris Weston. Who John became the costume designer. Yeah, exactly. And when Glyn told me that, I was like, that's amazing. And he was like, yeah, I know. And I go, no, you don't know. That is way crazy that a concept artist, because we're the jokers. We don't ever get elevated to high positions. It's an impossible ju gap to jump because people jump the gap and then hire us. It's very hard for a concept artist to become a production designer. It's really difficult um, because people, it, we're not on that ladder. So it was miraculous that, that and, and he's well deserved. Glyn did, he's an amazing costume designer. Um, but yeah, yeah, he's brilliant. Yeah, and then Jock and all those, they yeah, they all came in amazing. Yeah. Do you think that they're well? So go. No, I was saying they they they're well suited to it. But but part of it is where they're not suited. Not sorry, I don't mean those specific artists. I mean where comic artists may not be, may not be suited. Is you really are working in service of every all the other creatives. You have to have a thick skin for it because. As I said at the very beginning, um, you know, you, you don't, I remember actually production designer Gavin Bouquet said, oh, don't wait for Lucas to praise you. He won't. You're here. That's, you know, you're good. Otherwise you wouldn't be here. That's all you should know. 
because he won't because he wouldn't and directors rarely do because as i said they're just worried you know has there ever been a point where you've wanted to return to comics oh yeah i mean this this is what i'm i mean this is what i'm doing at the moment <laughs> not comics but i'm doing um I'm doing these wizards uh, doodles. Oh, it's what you're doing. Oh, I can't find them now. Yeah. Last day or two, I'm drawing these. These cards? Yeah, yeah. Or these uh, wizard cards? Because, um, you know, Magic the Gathering, the people have been asking me to do these blank, you get these artist proofs, the blank backs, whatever. And um, having worked digitally for 20 or 30 years, it's like, it's just, I think what it is, is I'm just like, the characters that I'm drawing on the back of these, I designed those characters because I did them for a stage of Wizards of the Coast, Magic the Gathering, when we weren't being given style guides, right? It was this era in the early 90s where, again, well, I was lucky to be in it actually, where the art direction was, here's a, here's a phrase, whatever you like. Yeah, it was great. So all my best work in for magic came from that period. Then they started giving us style guides and said, this character must look like this, this must look like this. And like, oh, it got really boring then. And um, so I'm just drawing. And when I finish the drawing, that's the drawing. I'm not showing it. To a director and him saying, "Oh, could it be this? Could it be that?" That's, no, and that's uh, that's what I miss. Now, the other side of that is, I don't really miss doing covers because that's so stressful. You know, you you you've got to get it right. Um, but being given a good story, a script, and and just hey, you're just telling this this story, and the drawing that I do, it's not going to go through another level of somebody asking me to change it because it's what I do. That's my style. That I miss. I really miss that, and I miss um, the feel of real materials. But the, but but I'm not nostalgic about that. I don't have like oh it's so. It's just you get things for free with real materials, but you get another set of things for free with digital. In a way, the restriction of real materials and paint um, throws out all sorts of stylistic things that that you get by accident, which is quite interesting. And just the feel of it, I love it. But by coincidence, I've just ordered an hour ago a, a drawing table, because I threw mine out years ago. I just Because I've been doing a lot of these cards and people are asking me to paint them, and I thought maybe I'll start doing a bit of this. Because it's because of the lockdown. I don't normally have <clears throat> time to do any of this. Um, I, you know, because the film industry is very, you know, you're, you're getting up at half six and you're back home at eight to get out of the London traffic. So you've very little time. And it's, it's, it does, it's, it's a very different thing. It's, there's a concept artist, Will Tay, uh, was a terrific concept artist for Star Wars. He was talking to me this morning. He was like, oh, you're doing, I see you're posting all these traditional material stuff. You, any chance you start doing that for films? I'm like, no way, not a chance. I'm not giving that to film. That's something I want to do that's mine, that is really, special and it's the you end up with a piece of art i mean greg was given greg staples was giving me um well what's the way of putting it kind of cajoling me into come on you should come back because he's he's done the same journey he went through digital and now he's coming back and he's doing these amazing paintings and i'm i'm seeing these paintings that he's doing and i'm like oh no and it's it's that feeling again of that time i saw busley now i see greg doing his death dealer picture and i'm like going, oh my I, I want to do that. <laughs> you know, it's the same feeling. It's the same enthusiasm. So I do miss it a lot. Yeah, I do. The other problem, though, is, you know, um, you get a, you know, John Wagner script, a really fun, it, yeah, brilliant. But if you threw yourself into it, oh, okay, I'm back. And then you got a script and it was like, yeah, it's not really what I'm thinking. Then your then your decision to go back would be you, you criticizing a writer. That would be appalling. You know what I mean? But I would be like, you know, I never did Batman really. Never did Judge that Judge Death cover that I did of him in the skull. 
Nah, I love to do Judge Death. But but then we all do. We all want to do that. So Dread, Judge Death, we all want to do that. But it would have to be proper old school Ballin style Judge Death. Not 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 a ironic twist. Do you know what I mean? Not a, like, yeah, Judge Death, it turns out he's I don't know, whatever. So yeah, in answer to your question in a long roundabout way, I do certainly miss it, yeah. fantastic stuff thank you so much to Dermot for chatting away really enjoyed that I hope you did too like I said um, if you've got any feedback on the podcast then do let us know on whichever platform you're on uh, but also uh, throwcast at 2080.com do help spread the word as well uh, we post up links on uh, our social media um, but there's, uh, you know, we're on Stitcher, we're on uh, Apple uh, Apple Podcasts as it is now, um, and uh, various other platforms. So, uh, yeah, just uh, bring a little thrill power into the lives of your friends and relatives. Athletes, we'll see you in a few days' time for more from the Thrillcast Lockdown Tapes. Um, the uh, two episodes a week format uh fitting it around all the other stuff that we have to do might be a bit of an issue but we will uh, attempt to uh, at least stay on a weekly schedule so uh, yeah more great chats coming up we've got uh, interviews with creators old and new plus more deep dives so uh, yeah stay tuned to the 2080 thrill cast and until next time take care of yourselves and splendid vertwick Alert! 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 Fill power levels dangerously high. Alert! Alert! Read 2000 AD every week. Ask your comic book store or newsagent now. Subscribe to the galaxy's greatest comic at 2000adonline.com.